new births in verse 1, new births in verse 4. Now, Bullinger and E.C. Moore and Ballinger, some of them got to work on this, and they finally came to the conclusion that the new birth was just for the tribulation because most of these pastors for the tribulation. So they knocked the new birth out of the church age. And Tom Ballinger and Mobile and E.C. Moore and Pensacola, they moved right in next to you, get your students. Eddie Garrett probably moved over here to take care of your church here, proof is known. Mrs. Rosa, 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 she said that he phoned her up and worked on her. So some of the rest of your members are probably getting the call pretty soon. On these heretics, half that God won't use them. God never called them. He can't do anything, so they'll work on your bunch. And so you see more move in there alongside the school, you know, and get as many students as you can, mess them up. And they come alongside there and say, well, the new birth is not for the church age, it's just for the tribulation. So when Jesus tells Nicodemus, except the man be born again, he can't see the kingdom of God, he's telling him that unless Israel be born again, Israel, see? But of course Christ said a man, except the man. So some people take the new birth and knock it out of the tribulation, or out of the church age and put it the tribulation. Now, I don't know, but I know this. I know when I got saved that I was born. I know that. I know when I was saved, I was quickened. That's clear from the Pauline epistles. I know when I was saved, I was put into a new family, and I got in the new family by blood and by birth. And I know that I'm called a son of God, and I was not a son of God. Therefore, I had to be born to get in the other family. I know God is my father now, and the devil was my father before, so I've switched families, see? So I teach the new birth is for this age. I say a man is born again by receiving Jesus Christ, John 1. However, maybe in the tribulation you still have people born again without being in the body of Christ. Now, that's probably the answer. Probably in this age when a man is born again, he's not only born again in a new family, but he's adopted into a family and placed into a body. And the tribulation, they're not placed in the body because the body's gone. But still, it's difficult. I mean, if a man is born again, I don't see how he can lose it. He can't be born again and again and again and again. And the tribulation, the fellow's salvation is contingent upon his faith and his works. All right, now I'll teach what I know of it. First John 5, 4. Whatsoever is born of God, well, the new, the new man, the New nature of the Spirit's born, whatsoever. Notice that time he didn't say whosoever, like he said in verse 3, 9, but whatsoever, whatsoever the Spirit's born of God, whatsoever is born of God, overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth? That believing is connected with birth. See that? Birth. Verse 4, belief. Verse 5, believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. Now notice the end of verse 4. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. We sing, In camp along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers rise, and press the battle there the night, you know. And then it says, Faith is the victory, faith is the victory, O oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. Did you ever wonder what that thing was all about? You know, didn't many a time you want to get a prayer answered, and you couldn't get it answered, you tried to have faith, and it didn't get answered? And you had faith to believe, but it still didn't answer, didn't get answered. And it took me the longest to find out when he said, This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith, that the verse didn't say, This is the victory that overcomes our faith to get a prayer answered, but simply our faith. The statement is not that I get a prayer answered because I got enough faith to believe it, and that's how I overcome to get my prayers answered. The statement is, The thing that overcomes the world is simply my faith. Not my faith in getting the prayer answered, my faith. In plain words, my faith in Jesus Christ, that's what overcomes the world. That's what does it. You overcome the world system by your faith in Jesus Christ. Not by your faith in Him to do anything or answer anything, but just by your faith in Him. That's the victory. The victory is our faith. Verse 6. <clears throat> this is he that came by water. Now, when John first said that in John chapter 3, what was he referring to? Earthly birth. Can a man enter the mother's womb a second time? Or let's leave John the context. This is he which came by water, earthly birth, water birth. The first life in the Bible comes from water, Genesis 1. He that came by water, that isn't baptism, that's birth. How do you know it's birth? Verse 1, born of God. 
Verse 4, born of God. The context is birth. Verse 6, this is he that came by water and blood. Where did Christ get his blood from? Where did he get his blood from? From the Father. Acts 20, 28 calls it God's blood. A man gets his blood from his father. Christ's father is who? God. All right. This seed came by water, first birth, womb birth, Mary, son of man, and blood. God. Supernatural birth. Even Jesus Christ. Not by water only. Not by just a human birth from the womb, but by water and blood. Christ had both natures when he was born. You don't get both of them until you're born again. Christ, the only man who ever lived who was born with two natures. He was born of the Son of Man, Mary, a normal birth, a water birth from the womb as a human being, and by the same birth he came out as the Son of God, born of the Holy Spirit, with divine blood in him. Now that's where he has the, the that's where he's got the edge on us. When we were first born, we were born no good. Then later we were born again. Now, did you ever stop think? That's why you don't get your glorified body until later. You got yours in installments. He got his one shot. And when Jesus Christ was born, he had both natures. So when he came up from the dead, he had his glorified body. See? Both natures. Now, you were born of the flesh. Water birth. Your mother's womb. Then you got born again. But when you got born again, you didn't get a glorified body. The only part of you born again was your spirit. That just born of the spirit of spirit. So this body is waiting to be born again. And because of that, Garner Ted Armstrong teaches, you can't be born again till you come up from the dead. Shall I get the Bible screwed up? Armstrong says the new birth is the resurrection. That's a half truth. That's the new birth of your body. But you've got to be born again, brother, before your body ever comes up. You're born again and you receive Jesus Christ. That's your spiritual new birth. All right, let's come at it again. <clears throat> Six. Now, verse 7 and verse 8 are what we call the Johannine comma in theology, and the verse shouldn't be in there, according to the scholars. According to the scholars, verse 7 has no business being in your Bible, so verse 7 and half of verse 8 are taken out in the New American Standard, and the ASV, and, uh, you know, Phillips and Mickey Mouse and Tarzan and all that. All right, six. This is he that came by water, first birth, water birth, life from the womb, and blood. From God, born of the Holy Spirit, God's blood, even Jesus Christ. Not by water only, not just by a physical birth, but by water and blood, the spiritual birth. And it is the Spirit, Spirit, spiritual birth, and it is the Spirit that bears witness, because the Spirit is truth. The Spirit bears witness to the two natures of Jesus Christ, human nature, divine nature. How does the Spirit bear witness to the human nature and the divine nature? Back to John chapter 19. Just stay in John. John is perfectly consistent. John chapter 19. <clears throat> Watch the Spirit bear witness. John chapter 19. <clears throat> Jesus Christ hanging on the cross. John 19, verse uh, 34. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side. And forthwith came there out blood and water. See that thing? Those fellows say, when the heart is ruptured, you know, the water is down the sack. That's interesting. But it's even more interesting to see what John says about it. Verse 35. And he that saw it for a record, and his record is true, and he knoweth that he saith true, that she might believe. What I think about water and blood wasn't done to show you he died of a broken heart, though that may make a good sermon. It was done to show you he had two natures, water and blood, that you might believe that he had more than one nature, two of them. Back to 1 John chapter 5, verse 6. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. Verse 7. This is the verse they don't like. Why? Because it's in the deity of Jesus Christ. Verse 7, you won't find it in the new ASV, you won't find it in the ASV, you won't find it in the Bible as recommended by the faculty of Bob Jones and John R. H. 7, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, 
he substituted the word word for the son. Boy, you talk about a past and a deity, look at that. That's saying the son is a member of the Trinity and the word is a member of the Trinity. And what John say in John 1, 1 and 1? Didn't he say the word became flesh? The word became flesh? Then John said the second member of the Trinity showed up in the flesh. Verse 7. They have three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. The fellow said, three and one, and one and three, and the one in the middle died for me. Verse 8. And there are three that bear witness in the earth. All right, in heaven is the Trinity. Down on earth is the man Christ Jesus. What about the man Christ Jesus? In earth. Eight. There are three that bear witness in earth. The Spirit. All right, the Holy Spirit testifies with the written record and writes the record. The Spirit and the water, earthly birth, and the blood, divine birth, birth, and these three agree in one. His human nature was sinless. His divine nature was sinless, and the Holy Spirit was sinless, and these three agree in one. Christ was one man. He was one man, but he had two natures. Verse 9, if we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he had testified of his Son. God has testified that in heaven the Son is a member of the Trinity, and down on this earth, the Son had two natures, and the Holy Spirit testifies that truth. All the arguments in the early church were about the Trinity and the two natures of Christ. They came from verse 8 and verse 9. Verse 10, a great verse. He that believeth in the Son of God. Do you believe in the Son of God? Do you believe in the Son of God? All right, claim it. Hath the witness in himself. Who's the witness? Verse 8. The Spirit, water, and the blood bear witness on this earth. He who believes in the Son of God hath the witness in himself. The Holy Spirit in you witnesses to you that Jesus Christ was a man just like you are, and he was God manifest in the flesh, and the man is inside you. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, like the fellows that took out verse 7, because he believed not the record that God gave of his Son, what is the record? Verse 7 is the record. So verse 7 is taken out by the faculty of Bob Jones, Midwestern Dallas, Columbia, and the, fac and the board of editors of the Soil of the Lord. Made him a liar because he believed not the record. God gave, You see, Brother Ruffin, how can good soul winning godly people do that? Flesh. Flesh. You see, <clears throat> the Christian thinks, boy, I tell you, if you ever think you have sin whipped, you've had it. You don't have sin whipped till you're dead. And a fellow will say, I won some souls. That's proof I'm filled with the Spirit. I wrote all these books they sold. That is proof God is with me. I get in all these big churches and preach. That's proof I'm of the will of God. I am Spirit-filled. God is using me. I am the will of God. And I'm educated. Therefore, I can change this verse. No, you can't. And the most godly dedicated man that ever lived can. You know what that is? That self. That's the educated self. And that self is just as damnable and hellish and godless as the drunken self, or the fornicating self, or the gambling self. The fellow goes out there and feeds that flesh and throws that stuff down where he's so busy, he can't see what he wants. He is just exactly like any soul-winning, fundamental, premillennial, born-again, spirit-filled Christian in this country that thinks he's smart enough to mess with that book. It just is disguise. Verse 11. And this is the record. You got it. You got it. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. I said, a fellow, you want some money? The guy says, yeah. I said, okay, I'm going to give you one catch. I'm going to get this money, put this dollar bill here in this book. You can have this dollar bill if you want it, just one catch. you got to take this book with it. You want the money? you got to take the book. The Lord says, you want eternal life? The guy says, yeah. The Lord says, okay, one catch. I'm putting it in my son. Hey, soul, that is proof God is with me. I get in all these big churches and preach. That's proof I'm of the will of God. I am spirit-filled. 
God is using me. I am the will of God. And I'm educated. Therefore, I can change this verse. No, you can't. And the most godly dedicated man that ever lived can. You know what that is? That self. That's the educated self. And that self is just as damnable and hellish and godless as the drunken self, or the fornicating self, or the gambling self. The fellow goes out there and feeds that flesh and throws that stuff down where he's a dizzy, he can't see what he wants, he is just exactly like any soul-winning, fundamental, premillennial, born-again, spirit-filled Christian in this country that thinks he's smart enough to mess with that book. It just is disguised. Verse 11, and this is the record, you got it, you got it, and this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. I said, a fellow, you want some money? The guy says, yeah. I said, okay, I'm going to give you one catch. I'm going to get this money, put this dollar bill here in this book. You can have this dollar bill if you want it, just one catch. you got to take this book with it. You want the money? you got to take the book. Lord says, you want eternal life? The guy says, yeah. The Lord says, okay, one catch. I'm putting it in my son. You can't get eternal life without taking the son. You want eternal life? You don't have any choice. If you want eternal life, it's in the son. All right, verse 11. This is the record that God given to us eternal life, and this life is in his son. What kind of life was in Jesus Christ, according to that verse? All right, in the life of the flesh and the blood, Leviticus 17, in the life of the flesh and the blood, then what kind of blood did he have in him? Eternal blood. Anyway, you can beat that thing. He got his blood from God the Father. Verse 11, this is the record that God given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. A great verse. One of the greatest in the Bible. Every word in it is a one-syllable word. You don't have to go to grade school to get saved. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Now, how's that for clear? Well, why does a guy start in Hebrews 6 and Hebrews 10 when he can start there? And isn't that something? Right in the middle of all that tribulation and stuff and double dealing and stuff and stuff you can't understand is the plainest verse in the Bible in salvation. He that has the Son has life. He that has not the Son of God has not life. You got Christ, you got life. You don't have him, you're dead. That's all. I picked up a guy one time in the car and got him in the car and I said, Are you saved? He said, That all depends upon what you mean by saved. I thought, Oh boy, oh yeah, yeah, here we go, man, here we go. And I said, Well, we won't argue what we mean about it. I said, The Bible said, He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Have you got life? He said, Yes, but through what medium do we receive life? And I said, I won't argue about that. He that hath son hath life, and he that hath not the son of God hath not life. Do you have life or don't you? He didn't. He didn't. Take a card and put it across there. You got a card? Take a, take a card, a piece of paper. And take your card, a piece of paper, and cover up everything but the top line in verse 12. That's the top line. See it? He that hath the son hath life. I take the card down, look at the bottom line. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Isn't that simple? If you're on top, you got life. On the bottom, you don't have life. You got life, you're on top. <laughs> if you got life, you're on top. And if you don't have any life, you're buried. You're on the bottom. Isn't that clear? He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. You have the Son of God, you got life. You don't, you don't. Uh, my head is in heaven. I got life. You can't drown me. If you ever see a man drown? <laughs> You ever see a drowned man with his head above water? You can't drown with your head above water. I'm down here in the great deeps, and the water's above me like that, and my head is on top just breathing so nice. But I don't worry about losing it. You can't lose it. Your head's above water. You're breathing. Back there in Ezekiel, Ezekiel went out there, and the Lord said, Measure that river, Ezekiel. Ezekiel stepped out there, measured that thing, was up to his feet and his ankles. And he says, Up to my ankle. The Lord said, It ain't deep enough, Ezekiel. Those people can still see you. Go out a little further. He got out there a little deeper and got out to his knees. Type of the Holy Spirit. Type of the Holy Spirit. Got out there and Ezekiel said, How's this? Lord said, I can see too much of you, boy. Keep walking. And he walked out there and that water came up there and got around his chest. He said, How's this? Lord said, I can see too much of the man. 
waited out there, and the Bible said he waited out there till it was a great river that no man could cross. It was a water clear to a man's head that a man would have to swim in. And you know something, brother, the more I live, the more I realize that I've got to get my preaching, my teaching down to where there's such a river of the Holy Spirit there that they can't see me, all they can see is the head. And boy, when the head gets preaching, you'll see something done. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Great verse, verse 13. That's one of those good 13s. 85% of the verse 13 is the Bible are bad, and 10% of them are good, and 5% are neutral. That's one of the good ones. The fellow led me to Christ, gave me this verse. These things have I written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know you have eternal life, comma, and that you may believe. See? After a guy gets saved, sometime he needs to believe, or he don't believe it. <laughs> I mean, sometimes a guy gets saved and then thinks he lost it. All right, that's written to you, so you believe and know you haven't lost it. That you may know you have eternal life, there's the unsaved fellow, and that you may believe the name of, there's the unsaved fellow, that you may know you have eternal life, there's the saved fellow, and that you may believe in the name of the Son of God, there's the unsaved fellow. Written for two reasons. These things are written unto you, believe in the name of the Son of God, saved fellow. One, that you may know you have eternal life, you already got it, and that you may believe in the name of the Son of God if you don't have it, or if you've got it and doubt you have it. It still be a saved man. All right, these things are written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God. Do you believe in the name of the Son of God? Do you believe in the name of the Son of God? Do you? Okay, what do you know? Read it. What do you know? What do you know? Folks say, what do you know? Okay, what do you know? That you have eternal life? Does it say that you may have it? Does it say that you may hope you have it? Look at it. Does it say you may guess you have it? Have you got it? Sure you got it. If you believe in the name of the Son of God. You know, when I got saved, I was a radio announcer. And I was a morning shift announcer at WAR in Pensacola, Florida. And I was sitting there spinning my records and smoking my cigars, you know, and drinking my Cokes and digging my own grave. And pretty soon in came Hugh Pyle and got in there and began to preach. I looked at that window at him and the Lord said, Now you see that fellow there, you talk to him when he comes out. And I got a look at that guy, he always did look young for his age. He's 56 now, looks like he's about 30. Back in those days, he looked like he was about 14. And bifocals, a little skinny neck, Adam's apple sticking out, little old freckles. I mean, he looked like he'd eat some raw meat. And I looked at him, you know, through that thing there, you know, and you know my background. I said, oh man, he don't know nothing. And the Lord said, if you don't think that fellow's a man, you just talk to him and he comes out. Now, he's got guts. And the Lord said, guts, to it didn't say intestines. He said, he's got guts. I said, okay, I'll check it. So Hugh Powell walked up and came by the studio, and as he walked by the doorway, I said, hi, preacher, what do you know? He said, I know the Lord Jesus Christ. What do you know? I like to swallow my stogie. <laughs> and I said, uh, I said, uh, what do you mean? And he said, what do you know? I said, uh, he said, I said, what do you know? He said, Lord Jesus Christ, what do you know? I said, uh, well, I don't know him. And he said, would you like to know him? And I said, sure. He said, what are you waiting for? And I couldn't understand that. I've been trying to get saved for three months. And that bird says, what are you waiting for? And I said, well, I, I don't know. And he said, come here. And he took me back in the record room, took out a Bible. He said, you believe this is the Word of God? I've been reading it for three months. I said, yeah, it's the Word of God. He said, you believe you're a sinner? I said, yeah, I know I'm a sinner. He said, you believe Christ died for sinners? I said, well, I guess he did. He said, you believe he could save a sinner? I said, well, I suppose he could. He said, you believe he could save you? I don't know. And he said, well, he was wise, you know. And he said, well, he said, hey, would you be willing to ask him to save you? And I said, sure, sure, sure. He said, okay, take my hand. Reached out and took his hand. He said, now bow your head and ask him to save you. And I said, I don't know how to pray. And he said, well, just go in your own words. Ask him to save you. And I didn't know how to pray. I knew Hail Mary and our Father, you know, but I don't know how to pray. <laughs> and he said, well, just in your own words. So I bowed my head and said, Lord, I'm a blankety blank sinner. And if I don't get saved pretty blank blank too, I'm going to hell sure as a blankety blank. And I want you to save my blanket blank soul for Jesus' sake. Amen. <laughs> I looked up at him and he was smiling. I said, what you laughing at? <laughs> and uh, he said, well, he said, did you mean that prayer? I said, you're blankety blank right on that. <laughs> and, you know, I, I, you know, that just goes to show you, you know, how wise that fellow was. If that fellow had been, been something like preachers, he'd have been so offended and so shocked, he would have lost the fish. But not you. And he said, did you mean that prayer? I said, you're blanket blank right on that. 
He said, well, if you meant it, he said, you're saved. I said, what do you mean I'm saved? He said, you're not going to go to hell when you die. I said, what do you mean I'm not going to hell? He said, well, you've trusted Christ, you're not going to go to hell. I said, I don't feel any different. He said, you're not supposed to feel any different. And I said, well, how do I know I'm saved then? He said, you just know. And I said, no, I don't. He said, yes, you do. <laughs> I said, I do not. He said, you do so. I said, I don't either. And he opened that Bible of 1 John 5, 13. He said, read it. And I read it and said, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know you have eternal life. He says, God says there you know. Now, do you know or don't you? And I read that thing and I said, Well, yeah, I guess I do. He said, What do you mean you guess you do? What does it say? It said that you may know. And he says, Do you know you have eternal life or don't you? And boy, he had me between a rock and a hard place, man. I don't know what to do. And I said, Well... And he said, you don't think God's a liar, do you? I said, no, 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 I don't think God's a liar. And he said, well, God says there you know, do you know or don't you? I said, well, yeah, <laughs> and although I didn't feel like I did. And he said, would you be ashamed to confess Christ publicly? I said, no. He said, right, what church do you go to? I said, St. Michael's. <laughs> and he looked kind of funny again. He had wisdom, boy, that fellow had wisdom. And he said, uh, you and me ashamed to make a public confession? I said, no. He said, I'll you come out of my church next Sunday and make a public confession. I said, I'll be there. And I was there. And boy, the first time I ever saying, yes, I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thy bids me come to the old Lamb of God, I come. I got out that seat, went down that aisle, and I'm going 15 steps down that aisle, then I knew I had eternal life. You know something? I accepted Christ by faith in that record room, and I didn't know till I confessed him publicly. I said, I never worry about giving invitation. Folks say imitations are in the Bible. Prayer all are in the Bible. Phooey, man. I, I've known people that didn't get assurance until they confessed. I think if I get saved, you ought to confess Christ public in baptism. You know why? That's everybody sitting there knows what happened to us. It does good for a guy when he gets saved to just take an out and out stand. You know what they object to most of these foreign countries in the mission field? They object to that public baptism. Did you know that? And you know, if you preach in Japan, you can get a lot of those folks to profess Christ, but you can't get them in that water. You know how they do it in South America? When that child of God goes out of that water, they cut him off. Because out of that water is a public statement, not only that I'm saved, it's a public statement that your baptism is no good. Now, that's why the Baptists always have the edge on them. I mean, I'm, I'm a Baptist. A lot of Baptists don't think I'm a Baptist. They think I'm a heretic, man. Uh, you know, open communion, they think, well, he ain't no Baptist, you know. Think he's a dispensationalist. Uh, and then a lot of, a lot of the uh, dispensationalists, they think I'm a Baptist. They think I'm a denominational sectarian. I'm right where I ought to be. I'm enough of a Baptist, you know, so the hyper calvinist dispensationalists cuss me for being denominational, and I'm enough of a Bible here where some of the Baptists think I'm a heretic. <laughs> but I, I always thought the Baptists had the best of the argument because... If you say, I won't put that fellow in the water until he gets saved, then you condemn every other denomination in the world, man. That's what the Baptist got the edge. A Presbyterian don't believe that. He sprinkles them on the babies. Oh, uh, well, these Campbellites, they don't believe that. They think the baptism is connected with salvation. I always have thought the Baptist had the best of it in that thing. And so I don't, I don't give a thing up. Of course, I don't, you know, I don't push it. I don't push it enough, you know, for the Baptist. I wouldn't. I don't. I don't push water baptism. I think if you can do it, you ought to get baptized. And if you can't, Lord knows, you're up there in an iron lung in the hospital. The Lord ain't going to kick you out of the bride of Christ because you can't go into the water in an iron lung. <laughs> All right, uh, verse uh, fourteen. And this is the confidence we have in Him. Here's the confidence. This ain't much confidence, you know. Sometimes <laughs> this thing I got here in this verse. Two car, I got a note here that says two gutter guys went back in a baggage car. And there was a there was a, a little old pen back there, had a dog in it, you know, somebody shipping somewhere. These two color guys are talking and said, Where did that dog come from? He says, I don't know. I said, Where's he going? I looked at him and said, I don't know, he done had his tag. <laughs> What's that doing verse thirteen? <laughs> well a Christian don't know where he's going. And know where he's coming from. You'll know what his tag says. 
That's the ticket. The tag says you've got eternal life. All right, 14. If we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. That explains why a lot of prayers don't get answered. You ought to ask according to his will. You say, I don't know his will. You better spend some time in that book and find out what his will is. If we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And we know that he hears us. And if we know we hear, he hears us, we know that. Whatsoever we ask, we know we have the petitions that we desire of him. Conditions on prayer. One, sins have to be confessed. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Two, generosity. Whoso stops his ear at the crying of the poor shall cry himself and shall not be heard. Three, do the things that are pleasing in his sight. Four, ask according to his will. Those are conditions of prayer. Five, ask believing. You have not because you ask not. You ask and receive not because you ask you miss and make some upon your lust. If, let's see. He that cometh to God must believe that he is. Whatever you ask, believing you shall receive, you shall have. Ask in faith, nothing wavering. Those conditions for answered prayer. All right, verse 16. If a man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask and shall give him life. For them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say he should pray for it. All unrighteousness is a sin, and there is a sin not unto death. Now we're in trouble. A Catholic church said it this way. They said there are two kinds of sins. Venial sins, mortal sins. A mortal sin is a sin unto death. A venial sin is not a sin unto death. Of course, that's nonsense. I mean, you take the priest down and say, Father, what's a mortal sin? Adultery is a mortal sin. Well, there wouldn't be hardly my left in the lie of the United States. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 5, Whosoever looks upon a woman to lust after her hath already committed adultery with her. You won't leave very many Catholic priests left, would it? <laughs> fellow said, well, you know, the Catholic priest, he's just going by the outward part. God don't go by the outward part. God goes by the inward part. Man looks on the outward appearance, the Lord looks in the heart. The fellow says, murder, murder is a mortal sin. Well, you'll have a lot of dead Christians. Whoever hates his brother in his heart is a murder. A lot of hatred among God's people. If any man see his brother sin, this image is not on the death. Eternal death or physical death? Well, you almost have to make it physical death. If any man see his brother, a Christian, sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask and shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. All right, let's apply. If I see a Christian sin a sin which is not unto death, God won't kill a fellow for, I can ask and God will give that fellow life and not kill him. What will God kill him if I don't ask? See how complicated that thing gets? If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. Well, if they weren't sin unto death, he didn't have to ask for them in the first place, did he? Well, let's try it a different way. If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, a sin that lasts until the fellow is dead, they're going to say, he shall ask, and shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. That won't work. He shall give him life, the fellow's going to live till he dies anyway. That ain't going to work. And the guy confessed his sin, God would forgive him and cleanse him. That won't work. There is a sin unto death. There's a certain sin you can commit that'll last till you die. There's a sin of the death. There's a certain sin God will kill you for. What is it? I do not say that he should pray for it. The fellow can, can, commits that sin, you don't pray for it. First Corinthians chapter 5, the guy was fornicating with his mother. Paul says, deliver him to Satan. I guess that means don't pray for it. Is that the sin he's talking about? 17. All unrighteousness is sin. All unrighteousness is sin. And there is a sin not unto death. You know, we're talking about two sins. One sin will God kill you for, and one sin God won't kill you for. There sure must be a lot of them God won't kill you for. Because <laughs> God knows we commit a lot of them without the Lord killing us. Tough passage, isn't it? All right, I'll teach it practically. That's the only way I know how to teach it. Doctrinally, I can't teach it. You say, what do you say about that doctrinally? Mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what that thing is. Um, I'll try two ways. I'll try tribulation. If any man see his brother sin a sin, which is not unto death, any sin, 
He shall ask and give him life for them and sin not unto death. If I see a sin, sin above the tribulation doing something wrong, I get out on the knees, say, Lord, forgive him, and let him keep on living, and he keeps on living. There is a sin unto death taking the mark of the beast. If I see a brother take the mark of the beast, I don't pray for him. I do not say that he should pray for him. I'll put it down there. All unrighteousness is sin. And there is a sin without naming it, not unto death, not a specific indefinite article, a sin. There is a sin not unto death, meaning a group of them. Right, so there's a sin not unto death, and there's a sin unto death, but there's a sin not unto death. There's a sin not unto death. Now I'll try that. We know whoever is born of God sinneth not. Then a guy born again in the tribulation cannot take the mark. Whoever is born of God sinneth not. But he that is begotten of God keepeth himself and that wicked one. That's the devil. The wicked one touches him not. Reference to the Antichrist. All right, I'll come back for a Christian. Verse 16, for a Christian. If any man, Christian, see his brother sin the sin which is not unto death, he shall ask and shall give him life for them and to sin not unto death. I see a Christian mess up. I pray and ask God not to kill him, but forgive him and let him live. He'll do it. There's a sin unto death for a Christian. Well, what is it? Well, unfortunately, there's a bunch of them. Uh, for example, 1 Corinthians 10. Uh, they murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. These things were written in example for our admonition, for us upon whom the end of the world will come. Wherefore, let him take the hand of souls on. First Corinthians 10 says, Murmuring against God is a sin of the death. They murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer, and that's an example to us. Number two, not bearing fruit. John 15 says, If a man doesn't bear fruit, he becomes withered as a branch, and men gather them and cast in the fire. Number three, living after the flesh. Romans 8, 13. If you live after the flesh, you shall what? Die. Die. Sin of the death for a Christian, 1 Corinthians 6, if any man, or 1 Corinthians 3, if any man defile the temple of the Holy Ghost, him shall God destroy. See? There's four sins unto death for a Christian. Five, lying to the Holy Ghost, Acts 5. When Ananias the fire coming there and lying to the Holy Ghost, they drop down dead. See, those five of them. Now, there may be some more. I think I ran down seven of them one time. Hymenus Alexander, whom I'm delivered to Satan, they may not learn to blaspheme. That's right. It's in First or Second Timothy. Okay. It's mentioned in First Timothy one on teaching false doctrine, and it's mentioned another Timothy on turn them over to the devil. Now, the only thing wrong with that is this. I made a good sermon, <laughs> but the only thing wrong with that is there are Christians who live after the flesh who don't die for a good while. And there are Christians who do teach false doctrine. They live for years. And I've known some Christians haven't any brought any fruit to the Lord for 55 years and just go to hell with I'm in. So I don't know, see? Yes. Well, the devil works on it. Yea, ask God to say it. Or the heart isn't right, the devil has power to deceive him. Yeah, that's right. If the Lord dropped every Christian dead that lied to the Holy Ghost, you'd be in rough shape, man. Because that lies so far, they come in there, they profess we put all our money in the plate, and they hadn't done it. Now, if every Christian, God killed every Christian who professed he did something he didn't do, oh, man, you'd, you'd be, be preaching the... Uh, Room full of corpses, maybe you are anyway. <laughs> Sunday morning. So I tell you, and you say, well, Brother Hubbard, I wish you could be more, you know, explicit. I'm sorry. Uh, First John, tough. All I can say is I could put that thing down the tribulation pretty close, but I couldn't put down the church age unless I mess with it. You put it in the millennium, uh, where, like in Matthew 5, uh, somebody uh, was going to his brother. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could millennium, and come to think of that passage in Matthew five, he says, "Whosoever shall say to his brother, if any man see his brother, see, do you know Paul didn't use that much? He mentions once in a while, but Paul says, fellow laborer, fellow companion, fellow saints, 
household of faith, brethren, saints, kinsmen, believers, disciples. You don't find that brother brother business too much in there. All right, First John five seventeen. All unrighteousness is sin. That's the ringtail bobcat. That's the greatest definition of sin ever given. If it isn't right, it's a sin. That's rough. If it isn't right, it's a sin. These folks who think the only sins you can commit are fornication, drunkenness, they're not very holy, brother. All unrighteousness is sin. If it isn't right, it's a sin. A fellow says, what's wrong with it? That ain't the problem. The problem is what's right with it. All unrighteousness is sin. All unrighteousness. If it isn't right, it's a sin. Boy, that sure covers a mess of territory, don't it? All unrighteousness is sin. And there is sin not unto death. All unrighteousness of sin includes everything that isn't right. First question you ask yourself, is it right? Is it right? Is it right? It's right. If it's not right, it's sin. These bones are right, they tickle the fire out of me, you know. They say, no war of baptism for this age. I never met a one of them wasn't baptized somewhere. I was talking to one the other day, with Denton down in Pensacola, and I said, uh, you don't believe water baptism in this dispensation? No, he doesn't. I said, he been baptized? He said, yes, before I learned the truth. I said, after you learned the truth, did you confess your sin? He said, my sin of what? I said, of getting baptized. Listen, man, that book says all unrighteousness is sin. Is it right to get baptized? Well, if it's not, it's a sin, man. Somebody said Paul got his advanced revelation in Ephesians 3 and it said one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and that threw out the rest. Well, he must have had a pretty clear conscience about the thing. Why didn't Paul ask God to forgive him for sinning when he got baptized? You think anybody as holy and righteous as Paul would forget to say, I thought baptism was for the Christian before when I got saved, but now that I had the advanced revelation of the body ministry, I realized I did the wrong thing, and I asked God to forgive me. No, sir, man. You, don't, you never find a Christian in the New Testament that repented of the sin of being baptized. I've been under the water and flowing water down there in the Dixon Mills Creek in Alabama. It never bothered me any. I never had any conscience about it. I think I did the right thing. If I thought I did the wrong thing, I'd ask God, ask God to forgive me, you know. You're so dead about ignorance. You're supposed to confess ignorance, don't you know? Go back look at Leviticus 5. Go back and look, look at Leviticus, Leviticus 5. But you're supposed to confess sins you do in ignorance, don't you know that? A fellow said, didn't confess it because he was ignorant. A sin committed in ignorance is just like a sin committed any other way. Sin is sin. Leviticus 5, 1. And if a soul sin, and hear the voice of swearing, and as a witness, whereof he hath seen or known of it, if he do not utter it, then he shall bear his iniquity. He bears iniquity. Verse 17. And if a soul sin, and commit any of these things which are forbidden to be done by the commandments of the Lord, though he wist it not, yet he is guilty. You know what that highway patrolman tells you? He says, ignorance is no excuse for breaking the law. Did you ever hear him say that? Well, listen, if it's wrong to get baptized in water like these bones you're right say, they can't say, well, before I got the revelation, I was ignorant, but now I got the revelation. Now that you've got revelation, you better get an order and ask God to forgive you for going under the water. <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> Don't believe in the order. They better ask God to forgive them for going down there the first time they got saved. <laughs> Oh, that Puritan, that bunch, that hyper-separatist, secondary separation bunch. What a bunch of fakers, man. Don't fellowship with anybody that fellowships with anybody has their laundry done by somebody who knows a liberal. <laughs> oh, you'd have to go out of the world to get separated from that separated bunch is. There's a separated, you know what they remind me of? They remind me of nuns and priests. Uh, we know whoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God, I'm reading like a Christian, Whoever is born of God, the new nature, sinneth not, incorruptible seed. But he that is begotten of God, the new man, keepeth himself, he circumcised in the flesh, and the wicked one touches him not. Can't touch that soul. That soul is cut loose from that flesh. He can get that body, but he can't get that soul. And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. The whole world lieth in wickedness. You go out there and such a beautiful world, you know. Like Bob Jones Sr. said, he said, it's such a beautiful world in its fallen state, I wonder what it's going to be like when the one that made it comes back and straightens it out. 
the whole worldwide wickedness. You step out there and walk out there, and those cornfields and those hills out there, and they ain't too much around here it's too pretty. I'm mean, really, there's not right around in here. I mean, I've been a lot of places. This ain't too pretty in here. <laughs> you got some place out there, you get far enough out from Dayton, you know, since 90, you can see them. You got these gullies, you know, where all you can see is the hills. It's pretty. <laughs> but you get out there and it's all like smog and junk. Isn't a whole lot there. But you take those cornfields and hills and things, they're pretty. And then the fall up here, it's pretty. You know, about two more weeks, it gets real pretty up in here. And you know what, what about that pretty world? That pretty world's under a curse. And that whole world lies in wickedness. And that's a sad thought. And you know, if it looks that beautiful, did you ever go to the Smoky Mountains in the fall? Every, every Christian will do one thing before he dies, if you can do it. You drive the Blue Ridge Drive in the south, <laughs> North and South Carolina, along about the first week in October. You go through there. And boy, you'll see something that'll just knock your eyes out. I'm an artist, and I paint. And I want to tell you, I've been through there, and I've seen things there you couldn't catch with a pile of the paint. You've tried. I've seen one tree, mind you. I've seen one tree where the top of that tree, the tip top of that thing, was red, and coming down, it was orange, and the middle of that thing was yellow, and the bottom was yellow-green, and the bottom leaves were green. On one tree. Just somebody just like, just with paint, and just dumped it across it. And you get across some of those places like, look out mountain, look out across there, and that thing just looks like 50 million artist palettes just all dumped and mixed together out through there. And that's the world that lies in wickedness. That's the world. It's my father's house. My father's home. Boy, can you imagine what that thing going to be like when the Lord comes back? I bet you when the Lord comes back, you'll have trees 300 feet high. 300 feet high. I bet you have roads as big as basketball when the Lord comes back. Oh, you talk about crops. I bet you the Lord comes out, back those old uh, grapefruit and oranges, get about the size of a basketball. Would that be something? Wouldn't be something you'd have a watermelon, you know, about half as long as a car? <laughs> Boy, you could just, you could just kick it open and lie down in it. <laughs> eat your way through it. That's how you eat watermelons anyway. I, I never a spoon and fork bit, all that stuff. The way you eat a watermelon is kick it open and then put it up against the barn and lean into it. <laughs> Just, I got to spit out the seeds. I'm saying, uh, well, Lord, now here it is, Father, and I just want to thank God, Lord, that I can give it away. And I That's the way it is. I mean, brother, he says, he says God loves a cheerful giver. Amen? All right, if you love the Lord, he says God loves a cheerful giver. If God gave, you ought to give. Amen. Cheerfully, see, come by and say, thank God I got it to give. Plop. <laughs> All right, verse 8. He that loveth not, knoweth not God. For definition, God is love. Now, don't you see what you could do with that? I mean, Mary Baker Eddy took that thing and said, God is love, and then she reversed it. She said, love is God. See, what you can do with that thing? For God is love. Well, that is no, God's a spirit. That is no, our God is a jealous God. That is no, our God is a consuming fire. See, there's more to it than that. And when you just get the positive part of it, see, like he never prophesies any good to me but only evil. When you get just the positive side of that thing, folks say, well, God love. And then get rid of everything else about God. When you take all of God's attributes from him but love, you can say love is God. When you say love is God, then you can use human sex relationships as the supreme God. When you do that, you bring in the African jazz band and restore Baal and Ashtoreth, and you go right back to the general. A, a God that's all love, and I'm going to say it real clear, a God that's all love and nothing else is a spiritual pervert. And I mean it. If God can't hate, and if he can't judge, and if he can't take vengeance on his enemies, he's not God. And when I read my Bible about God, I've got a God that's complete. The God I know is perfect wrath, and perfect mercy, and perfect love, and perfect justice, and perfect pity, and perfect hatred. You say hatred for what? Hatred for sin. What do you think? 
And I'll tell you, God that loves impurity and unchastity and perversion and stealing and swearing and killing and murder and lying and stealing, just like he loves purity and courage and goodness and truth, is a spiritual pervert, and the quicker you kick him off the throne, the better it'll be for everybody. That's what's wrong with this whole generation. I like what Joseph Parker said. He lived a hundred years ago. Joseph Parker said this modern new God. He's nothing but just love, dressed up to the throne on his head, and some of you people think God's just a big old kiss sitting up in heaven. <laughs> that ain't it. You hear these modern tunes, you know? You know, I see him in the mountain. He's in the little baby. He's in the little he's everywhere. When I see a mountain, I think of his love, you know, that kind of business. You know what they're doing? They're taking all the stuff about God, heaven, the Bible, and putting in the popular songs, and they're taking all the love and the sex out of popular songs and putting them to him. You know, cry in the chapel, you know. Somebody's singing there, Lord above me, help him love me. The way, Lord above me, you know, the way he should. I got it bad, you know. You must be an angel on a visit from the skies. I'll build a stairway to the stars. It would be heaven to climb to heaven with you. <laughs> you know what they do? They took out a lot of heaven and God and stuff, put that in the popular stuff and debase it and then take the stuff out of the popular stuff and put it in the hymns and debase the hymns. Now, I'll sing, My Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine. But you take that, My Jesus, My Jesus. Did you ever read that in the Bible anywhere? I mean, like my darling, my little baby doll over here. Did you ever read that in the Bible anywhere? Well, I'll sing it. I understand the sentiments of the song. Get these quartets singing, Jesus. My Jesus. Nuts. <laughs> Listen, brother. Uh, Jesus Christ is the Lord of Lords and King of Kings, the Lord of Glory. And the real sentiment is more like Ferris, Lord Jesus, ruler of all nature, O thou of God, man the Son, thee will I honor, thee will I cherish, my soul, salvation, life, and song. Fair is the sunlight, fair is still the moonlight, fair all the twinkling hosts above. Jesus is pure, Jesus is fair, that all the angels heaven can boast. See, that's what's going on. And so you get that kind of a light, frothy kind of a Jesus. It's kind of you and me hand to hand loving each other. See, that isn't it. That isn't it. All right, verse uh, 9. And this was manifested the love of God toward us. Because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. You understand that? That's self-explanatory. Here in his love, definition. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. You didn't love him first. He loved you first. Before you were saved, you didn't love him. Some of you use his name as a cuss word. I did. One time a little girl crawled up in mama's lap and the mother said, uh, Honey, you love me? And she said, Yes, yeah, she said, I love you. And she said, Why do you love me? The little girl said, well, I guess I love you because you love me. The mother said, well, that hurts my feelings, she said. Just kidding, little girl. You know, the little girl said, well, I guess the real reason I love you is because you love me first. See? And a lot of truth in that. We loved him because he loved us first. Uh, I can't imagine Jesus Christ going on the cross and dying for me in the condition I was in before I was saved. I can't imagine it. We come in drunk at night and we in the officer's shower room, we'd always sing the old rugged cross, and I'd come to the garden alone. I don't know why drunks always pick those two songs. I guess because they have good harmony in them. <laughs> but we'd come in and drunk at night, 11, 12 o'clock at night, go in there and stand in the shower and sing, I come to the garden alone, all I do is still on the roses, you know. And the voice I hear falling on my ear, the Son of God discloses. And he walks with me and talks with me, and tells me I am his own, and the joy we share, we tire. We didn't know what we were singing. Just, uh, I mean, I know what that thing means now. But back in those days, you know, just a good harmony, barbershop. You talk about Fairbanks, Alaska. I knew a missionary at one time, oh, about 15 years ago. He told me about a character up there. Uh, maybe it was you. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> He told about a character up there that would it'd be pretty rough. He told about a character up there that would go on those bars in Fairbanks and stand up on those tables on Wednesday night and give mock testimony meetings. 
And that guy would stand up there and say, Oh, Charles, I work testimony here, prayer meeting tonight, you know. And everybody get up, you know, guy get up and thank God for his companion in the sand and thank God for his bottle. Praise the Lord for his good whiskey, boop, you know. <laughs> and you think, boy, the Lord ought to kill a guy like that. But he didn't. And that guy get up there and stagger around there and say, prayer meeting tonight, who's got a good prayer? You know? Who wants a prayer, you know? That thing went on for months. And you think God would strike a guy like that with light and strike him dead. You know what God did to that fella? He saved that fella. <laughs> And the last time this missionary saw him, he's going in out of those bars passing out tracks. Well, now we loved him because he first loved us. See? George Whitfield was a great preacher. And George Whitfield had a lot of adversaries and opponents. You don't read much about him in history, but, but every guy that ever stood for it just got it coming and going, man. There's no way to get around it. And George Whitfield, when he preached, there were about three men who used to follow him all over the country and make fun of him. And they'd imitate him. They'd have these big drunken parties, social parties, and all these high society folks from London, and these guys would get up and see who could give the best imitation of George Whitfield, and everybody would laugh and applaud, you know, and the guy that got the best one got the prize each night. And boy, one night, they got up there, and the first guy opened the Bible, you know, and got his text, took it by, just hit or miss, preached, second guy did a little bit of applause, the third guy got up, just on the same drunks. The Bible put his finger down and said, Except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. <laughs> and he got up and preached. And the people there that night said, Never in their life have they ever heard a more terrible sermon than that on the horrors of hell. And one guy there said it just made his blood run cold and his hair stand on end. He said, There was no time in his life he ever heard hell preached about with no grace. There was no grace in the preacher, he was unsaved. And there was no compassion because he didn't care. And he said, that guy got up and got into that text and something got a hold of him. And he said, point number one, all shall perish. Point number two, all those that repent won't perish. Point number three, except you repent, you'll perish. <laughs> and that guy preached that thing and something got a hold of him. And his eyes began to stare and his mouth began to foam and he began to wave his fist and put out that thing and he preached that thing for something like... 35 or 40 minutes and boy he got through he was just standing there glaring out into space and nobody applauded nobody laughed and that guy finished his message and said and that's it got out off the table and walked out the door and 24 hours he was saved he just preached himself right into heaven man just preached himself right out of conviction <laughs> but you can't you can't say that guy loved the Lord for the Lord loved him all right, verse uh, 10. Here it is, love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation. Not a propitiation, just one of them, but the propitiation for our sins. I pointed out the word the other day. It's a payment sent ahead to fix up a situation between two parties. Beloved, if God so loved us, and he did, we ought also love one another, and we ought. We should. No man has seen God at any time. No, same thing in John 1, 1, 18. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwells in us and his love is perfected in us. Again, you have to watch out for John. If we love one another, God dwells in us. Well, God dwells in a Christian even when he's not loving the brother. So as I said before, you've got to watch old John's application. If we, We'll have to say it practically. We'll say practically. If we love one another, God dwells in us in the sense of comfortable in the home and not grieved, not quenched. Well, I'm saying that it's going to put it in this age. It's going to come in that way. And his love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us, witness of the Spirit, because he hath given us of his Spirit. Now, I pointed out the other day about four ways you can know you're saved from First John. That's one of them. Hereby know we that we dwell in him. You want to know that? And he in us, by, because he hath given us of his Spirit. Uh, you want to know the witness of the Spirit? Bow your head sometime and close your eyes and say, Lord, if I were to die tonight, where would I go? That old Spirit come there and say, Hell. You say, Lord, that Spirit said hell. Does that Spirit confess that Jesus Christ come in the flesh? No. Lord, if I were to die tonight, where would I go? Would I go to heaven? Yes. Lord, that Spirit that said yes. That Spirit confess Jesus Christ come in the flesh? Mm-hmm. You think I'm just talking? Try it. 
You bow your head and get praying along that way, and you watch the Holy Spirit bear witness with your spirit that you're a child of God. All right, verse 14. And we have seen, and I'll tell you something else. If you're not saved, you won't. If you're not saved, you bow your head and say, Lord, if I tonight, if I go to heaven? Yes. That spirit that said that, yes. That spirit confess Jesus Christ on the flesh? No. Or would I, where would I go? You go to hell. You try to talk to yourself and you say, heaven, heaven, heaven. I go to heaven. I go. That spirit says, hell, hell. And I'll tell you something else. That spirit won't say Hades. Amen. He won't call an ASB. He'll say hell. Yeah, the Holy Spirit, he knows which book's the right one. All right, 13, hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen, well, John saw him, because he's talking about God in the flesh. When he says, no man has seen God at any time, 12, he's talking about the eternal Father, like in John 1, 18. When he says in verse uh, 14, he's talking about God in the flesh. And we have seen and do testify the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Notice, uh, not the Savior of the elect. John Calvin off again. Savior of the world, not the elect. God so loved the world. Savior of the world. Now, the elect do this. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him and he in God. Well, of course, John has taken for granted what you found in Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10, that it's real. A man just saying, Jesus, the Son of God, doesn't do it. I'll show you why it doesn't. Turn to Mark. When old John says confess, he's talking about something a little stronger than just saying something. Look at Mark 1, verse 24, and Mark 5. And notice that just saying Jesus Christ, the Son of God, that isn't the, a guarantee of salvation. Mark 5, Mark 1. All right, Mark 1, 24, the demons. Mark 1, 24. Saying, let us alone. What have I to, we, we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. The demons know that. Mark chapter 5, verse 7. Demons again. Mark 5, 7. And cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of of the most high God. And God wasn't dwelling on that man, unclean spirits were dwelling in. So when John says confess, he's talking about an honest confession and an honest, in the tribulation, an honest confession under pressure. In the tribulation, that thing will be a raise your right hand with two fingers up. Do you swear by God for this man standing in front of you is the Lord Jesus Christ? I do. Okay, take the mark. Right in the head. Now raise your hand. Do you swear by God this man is Jesus Christ come in the flesh? No, he's not. Jesus Christ has already come in the flesh. <laughs> Who's your head? See, that's why I say, oh, John, you got to watch him. And John says, confess. See, he's talking about more than just a guy saying, well, I believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That isn't it. That thing is confession where John says that confession there amounts to something, brother. And the tribulation that'll cost the guy his head. All right, 15, whoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. Again, God is love. Not love is God. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love, the kind of love of verse 10, dwelleth in God and God in him. I'm not talking about carnal love. I'm not talking about Hollywood love. Verse 17. Herein is our love made perfect. Aren't you want to love God like you should? Here's how you do it. Herein is our love made perfect. No Christian can love the Lord like he should love him if he's always worried about losing his salvation. No Christian can. If you want to love God like you should, then quit worrying about going to hell. And God knows you've got 20,000 Christians in Ohio that live from day to day worrying about losing it. Amen. All right? Here in his love, our love made perfect. How is it? Well, it has to be made perfect that we may have boldness the day of judgment, second coming, white throne. Because as he is up there now, so are we in this world now. We'll read it and then explain it. There is no fear in love. If you really love God like you, 
should, there's no fear. Fear about what? The day of judgment. Now, he didn't say a fear about something else. In Philippians, he said, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. See? So a Christian is to fear God, but not about the day of judgment. See? In other words, I should worry about my Christian life and my Christian service, but I don't ever have to worry about the day of judgment. Why? Because as he is, so am I in this world. You know, I'm going to get by the judgment just like the Lord Jesus Christ is going to get by it. You know why? Because the day of judgment, I'm going to be just like the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Sure, man. First John 3 says you're going to be like Christ before the millennium. How are you going to be at the white throne judgment? Just like Jesus Christ. Amen? Sure, man. First John 3 says you're going to be like Christ before the millennium. How are you going to be at the white throne judgment? Just like Jesus Christ. All right, verse 18, there's no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear, because fear hath torment. Poor Christians in Trenton and Middletown and Hamilton. I think if I want to live it, I used to live it, I don't live anymore. I, I got saved once, but I'm not saved now. I, I, I had a feeling, well, I, I never had to have a feeling again. Well, I went down there one night, and I know something happened to me. Torment, man, torment. You just rest. Listen, if you receive Jesus Christ, your Savior, you're just good as in heaven with the door shut. And you might just well enjoy it, instead of being miserable. <laughs> I talked with a pastor's wife one time near here, and she was always worried about losing it. I still think she's kind of upset about it. And I talked to her one time, and I said, let me ask you something. I said, what you count on saving you? And she said, well, Brother Ruffin, she said, I know what to say, but I just, uh, but I, I just, uh, I don't think I should say that, because I've just learned that. I said, okay, looky here. I said, suppose you drop dead right this minute. Do you want to go to hell? She said, no, no. I said, what you counting on keeping you out of hell? And she said, well, I know what to answer. I said, okay, don't answer me that. Tell me the truth. <laughs> I mean, you're not, you don't want to go to hell, no. What are you counting on keeping you out of hell? And she said, well, the blood of Jesus Christ. And I said, I got bad news for you. And she said, what's that? I said, you're not going to be able to go to hell. You're going to have to go to heaven. <laughs> and she said, what do you mean? I said, if you count the blood of Jesus Christ to save you, you're going to heaven. So just quit trying to think you want to make it to hell, you're not going to make it. There isn't a case where anybody ever went to hell that was counting the shed blood of Jesus Christ to save their soul, and if there is, nobody in this room is saved. Amen. You're just going to hell with the door shut, so don't worry about that either. <laughs> if you're going to hell, nothing can do about it, so don't worry about that. And if you're going to heaven, praise the Lord, so don't worry about that. God's people, they torment themselves with that kind of business. I told you before, I'll tell you again about a color lady I saw down south one time. I know these things are, uh, you know, you hear these things before, but it, it makes such an impression on you. I saw a car lady going down the street like this, and she had a little white boy in her hand. He was about four years old, and she was taking him someplace. I don't know where, but some white woman, you know, get told her, take that kid someplace, and she's taking him. <laughs> and she weighed about 230 pounds, and she was dragging that kid down the street, and his feet were hitting the street about once every four steps. And he was just screaming and hollering, bloody murder. And that old color lady was going, la, she lost, 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 And that kid, kid was going, boom, 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 down the street. You know, I saw that and I said to myself, you know what that's a picture of? That's a picture of the Holy Spirit taking one of these Christians to heaven that thinks you're going to lose it. <laughs> Now, you know something, you can holler and scream and squall all you want, but the Lord is going to get you home. And you might just well reconcile yourself to it instead of hollering and raising chain about it. 18, there is no fear in love. Perfect love casts about fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. You talk about love, 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 okay. If you doubt your salvation and think you can lose it, don't talk to me about love. You know nothing about it. If you love God like you should, you know he's true to his word, he's dumb and necessary to get you there, and he's going to get you there. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, there might be some connection, but I've heard, of, I've heard a lot about these uh, hard-shell Baptist preachers down in Kentucky and Tennessee that they continually preach on hell and judgment. And they very seldom ever preach on the love of God. Uh, how would you find that there? Well, that's true. Some of those fellows are putting fear and torment into a fellow who's already saved. A hard shell Baptist, a primitive Baptist who spends all the time on that, is eventually he'll talk some Christian into thinking that he hadn't been saved. 
Yeah, no, that's right. I'm one of the elect. Now, I'll show you how to do that. And now, down at our school, when a guy comes in there, we tell him we're a moderate dispensationalism and a moderate Calvinism. That's what we tell a fellow. The reason why we tell a fellow that is if a man is not a modern Calvinist, he can get in some bad trouble. I'm sure what's going on in this country today. Now, without naming any names, but I have right in mind a, a pastor who's going to be a pastor in the next few months, and uh, was from Mississippi. I have in mind an evangelist who went to a modernistic Southern Baptist seminary and got saved, putting out tracts all over the country, which is good. I think it's wonderful. I have in mind. All right, 419, we love him because he first loved us. Back up at verse 10, same sentiment. If a man say, profession, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, and we had it back here in John 14, 15, 16, and we had it also back in 323. This commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. From this the modernist gets the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, which is not a Bible doctrine. In the context where it occurs, it's talking about a Christian or a professing Christian claiming to love God and not loving a brother in Christ. And of course, as John uses, it's pretty rough. Evidently, a Jewish brother, brethren in the tribulation, evidently. All right. have we from him that he who loveth God love his brother also. Chapter 5. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ, is born of God, meaning really that Jesus, Jehovah saved, is the Messiah, the Christ, is born of God. You get born again by believing. And everyone that loveth him that begat, that's God, loveth him also that is begotten of him, begotten of God. In English, every Christian that loves God, the one that begat him, also loves anybody else that is begotten of God. In fair words, if you're born again, you lo or love everybody else who's born again. Our, uh, our bond of affinity is our birth. We're one family. That's probably why Christians have such a tough time getting along with each other, because they are one family. Now, you folks that have families, you know how it goes. And I've raised three boys and two girls and raised some more. And you know how families are. I mean, you tell them to love each other. Have you ever noticed, ever noticed how hard it is for two brothers to play together? Now, you've got a neighborhood kid over there and they have the biggest time. You can send, even better, send one kid to one neighbor and one kid to the other neighbor. And they get along so good, you bring over one neighbor boy and they'll both be kind of show him which one of them is the best and get his attention, you know. But you think brothers could get along good, but you wouldn't think that if you read the Bible. The first two brothers, one of them killed the other one. You know, so don't knock him down, you know. Well, I ought to, he's my brother. <laughs> And uh, you take God's people, God's people have a worse time getting along than unsaved people do. And the reason why is probably because they're in the same family. Most unsaved people in the personal dealing will treat a Christian pretty fair if he doesn't have to work for them. Now, if you're working for an unsaved man witness, he can make life miserable for you. What's all that? <laughs> <laughs> you got air conditioning in the building? Oh, electricity. <laughs> And so, now if you work for an unsaved man, he make life miserable for you. But you take this, the unsaved people you deal with out in the world from day to day, they'll treat you nice than the Christians. You take a Christian and get a sure enough grudge against you. Brother, he'll devote his time just to make a life as mean for you as he can make it. And it's because the member of the same family is two of boys kneeling down to pray, and the little brother kept pinching the big brother and kicking him and tickling him while he was praying. And the older brother said, pardon me, God, i got to kick Billy for a minute. And quit praying, lead over and kicked him, you know. And many a Christian, you know, has to say, excuse me, God, i got to kick Billy. Don't take time out to kick Billy. Two, by this we know we love the children of God. When we love God, and keep his commandments. Notice again the words. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. And his commandments, 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 commandments. That thing will fit right down the tribulation, no place else. Or not Please turn the cassette over. This is the end of side one. Please turn the cassette over. Now, Bollinger and E.C. Moore and Ballinger, some of them got to work on this, and they finally came.